So, hi everyone, welcome to our meetup. We're gonna give everyone just about a minute to get settled before we really get started. Uh, so before I, we get started, I'd like to introduce the other people in this live stream. Uh, I'm uh, there's Monica. She's uh, my co-host from the Women Tech Makers. Um, in the middle, you can see Vietze, who is uh, gonna be giving our presentation today. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's twelve. So let's get started. Uh, today's meetup is about Cloud Run. That's the new service from Google that lets you run your containers. And uh, Wietse, the guy that literally wrote, wrote the book on it, because uh, his book is published by O'Reilly, is going to tell us all about it. Um, the meetup is organized by the GDG Cloud Netherlands and the Women Tech Makers. Uh, I'm from GDG Cloud Netherlands. Uh, we're organizing meetups about everything that's uh, remotely related to Google Cloud. Uh, so if that's something that interested, interests you, you can follow us at these URLs. And uh, normally uh, at a physical event, uh, you can find me or my co-organizers running around somewhere and talk to us. Uh, today, you'll see a couple of us in the, in the live stream next to YouTube. And we're organizing this event uh, together with the Women Tech Makers. So off you go. Nice. Thank you so much, Constantine, for the very nice introduction. So my name is Monica, and I'm going to be also co-hosting this with Constantine. And I'm super excited to, to introduce also Bitsa. The, the Cloud Run is going to be such a nice topic today. So let's talk a little bit about Women Tech Makers. So we are a global initiative, right, which is supported by Google. So what do we do? So we try to provide visibility, community, and resources for women or men or cats or anyone <laughs> <laughs> interested in technology. Uh, we're in the Netherlands, and we really like to organize regular events. Usually, um, yeah, they're like in person, but now we can't. So we're doing online. Also workshops and try to share with you all nice or useful resources we find. And of course, everyone is welcome. So welcome and thank you very much for being here. You can always find us in our social media. So we have uh, Instagram, Twitter, Discord, Meetup, Facebook, LinkedIn, <laughs> whatever you want. And you can find it on the, on the description uh, on the YouTube. So you just push there, please join us. Uh, the bigger, the better. So we're really happy to, to welcome everyone. And of course, it's not just me. It's like with these beautiful girls that I have here. So we have Natalia, Manitza, Virginia, and Janique, which are also a part of Women Take Makers. And Janique, she's also here. You cannot see her with Manitza, but they're in the background <laughs> and in the back end. And Natalia and Virginia, they're also supporting us today. So having said that, I think it's moment for Pizza to take over and tell us everything about Cloud Run. Sure. Yeah. Bring it up. Yeah. So um, first, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to give this talk today for uh, Google Cloud uh, NL and uh, Women Tech Makers. Um, but before we head into the talk, I want to explain Google Cloud Run in one diagram and tell you why I, as a software engineer, am so excited about it. The Cloud Run developer workflow is a straightforward three-step process. First, you write your application using your favorite programming language. And the only requirement there is that your application should start an HTTP server. Second, you build and package your container into a container image. And finally, you deploy the container image to Cloud Run. And once you've deployed your container image, you will get a unique HTTPS endpoint back. So that means you don't have to manage HTTPS yourself. Your app is running there. And Cloud Run starts your container on demand to handle requests. And it ensures that all incoming requests are handled by dynamically adding and removing containers. As an engineer, it's, it's hard to not get excited about this, right? Because it's a process that lets you focus on writing code and not on the infrastructure underneath. You'll be like, here's my code. Uh, go ahead and deploy, run, and scale that for me. And I. To be honest, I don't really want to know how many servers you use to do that. Make sure it runs and that it runs good. Um, yeah, but before I tell you everything about Cloud Run, I want to tell you a little bit about me. My name is Wietse Venema. And for the international listeners, 
Um, my name is pronounced like this. We, like we go to the park. We, sir. We, sir. I'm a software engineer by trade uh, and a trainer at Binx. And Binx is a cloud native IT services company. We are strong in engineering, training, and digital transformation. And we work with all public clouds, Google Cloud, Amazon, Azure, and Alibaba. Um, I like to draw diagrams to explain things. And I'm sharing those on my LinkedIn and Twitter. So feel free to connect with me or follow me. Um, and I'm from the Netherlands, which you could probably tell from my accent. And that also means that I own more than one bicycle, um, and I put chocolate sprinkles on my bread for lunch. One more thing. Um, this confuses a lot of people. I'm not the famous Wheats of Enema who created Postix and now works at Google. That's super confusing. But well, here's the non-famous Wheats of Enema who also published a book. Um, yeah, a book. So this is my main professional accomplishment in 2020. I wrote the O'Reilly book about Cloud Run, and that, that's kind of a big deal. Um, I, I, I also wrote it in 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, with my two-year-old and my four-year-old running around. Well, that last part is a lie, um, because I wrote most of it after 10 PM, when everybody was sleeping, uh, because just cool closures and everything. Um, I'm a first-time author, and, and this, has, this was an epic learning journey for me. And, and, and the best thing. I, of this whole process is that people really like my book. And, and to be honest, that's that's quite a relief if you've just spent two solid years creating something. And, and here, this is this is Kelsey Hightower. He's he's a well-known person in our community, and he wrote the foreword to my book. And I'm so excited by this because his leadership has been an inspiration to me and to many others in the in the tech community. And, and this is what he wrote. I'm just going to read it out because I'm so happy with this. I've I've onboarded thousands of customers, and I wrote a framework to help Go developers build Cloud Run applications faster. And even I learned a thing or two from this book. What took me three years to learn, Vitsa delivers in less than a dozen chapters. Well, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm super proud of this achievement. And But what makes me even more excited is that people are actually using my book to, to do their jobs. And, and this is why I started writing in the first place. Um, this is Simon, and he wrote me to say that he is looking forward to use my book as a reference in his project. And Silvio from Spain, he wrote me to tell me that his book has a real impact on his day-to-day -day work. Well, that makes me happy. Um, one more thing I want to share with you before I head into the talk, last one, I promise, is that I'm also working with Google Cloud to build the official Cloud Run course. So, and in a way, this very session you're in now is a sneak preview of one of the modules in the course, as the content in it is inspired by my work on the course. This session, coming out of this session, you will understand how Cloud Run compares to other compute platforms on Google Cloud. It will help you understand what workloads might be a good fit and the ones that aren't. And assuming that I don't run out of time, um, there's a demo at the end and time for questions. Yeah, about questions. If you have questions during the talk, feel free to move over to the comments there. Yeah, to the comment box, uh, because I will monitor it, during my, monitor it during my presentation and answer questions on the spot if, um, <laughs> if they're relevant. And yeah, I should have used Python because it's more popular. I, I agree, kind of. But Go is also very nice. Um, so. Um, I, I like interactivity. So pop the questions in the comment box. I will get uh, round to answering them at the end. Um, well, um, about you, I, I would love to know where you're from. Um, so please head over to that comment box and post in the chat your country, city, and role. So I get a feeling of who you are and where you're coming from. Go. Do that now. I love to see this. I had a I had a person from Vietnam join the other day, and uh, and Brazil. I'm I'm super curious to learn where you're from. And there's a bit of lag here, I think. Go do it. London, Netherlands. Hey, Mark. Greece, Gouda, Tajikistan, slash Utrecht. Wow. Oh, this is great to read. 
I'd like to see Mark Kaigsman pop up here. I worked with him like a, almost five, not more, month, might be eight years ago. Excellent. So I live in Amersfoort, in the like the the geographical middle of the Netherlands. Okay, I'll continue. Let's start by introducing you to or refreshing your knowledge of containers. And let's start with the structure of a container image. A container image is a package with your application in it, right? Along with everything your application needs to run. So for example, in a container image for a Java application, your application is packaged together with the appropriate Java virtual machine. OK, that might still sound a bit abstract, so zoom, let's zoom in a bit further. A, a good way to think about a container image that is that it's an archive with files. And those files include system libraries, executable programs, data files, um, such as but not limited to HTML files, images, uh, binary data. Um, and if you use an interpreted language, such as JavaScript or Python, your application source files might even be in there. And in the rest of this session, I'm, I'm talking about container images and containers. Both are very different concepts, so it makes sense to clarify them. If you run a container image, that's a container. Running a container image means that you are executing one of the programs that are stored inside the container image. And in case of that Java application, the program you run is the Java virtual machine. So a container represents the running processes of your application. It only exists at runtime. If there are no running processes, there is no container. And then there are two very important characteristics of a, a container. There, there are more, but these two are really important to understand. So first, all the files from that container image, you put them in a container image, and all those files are used to create a private file system for your the container, the running processes of your app. And these are all the files that your application will see. So it, it needs to everything needs to be in there. So that's why why I said your application and everything it needs to run. Um, and then second, your application has access to a virtual private network interface with a local IP. And this means that you can always open a port and and listen for incoming connections. And that's exactly what Cloud Run expects your web application to do. It wants you to listen on port number eighty eighty to handle HTTP requests, and that includes. Um, HTTP2 and gRPC. Um, but you can't, for instance, start an SMTP server and expect that to work, right? So the, the port number 8080 is a configurable default. Um, so if you can't listen on port 8080, you can change it. Uh, maybe you only can listen on 80 or, or 3000 because you're running Ruby. I, I don't know. You can change it. and. When I say HTTP, you might think, well, that, that's not very secure. Um, doesn't, need, doesn't that need to be HTTPS? Well, the answer is that you don't need to provide an HTTPS server because Google handles that for you. Um, and they tell us that your traffic is always encrypted on their internal network, so we're probably safe there. Besides the requirement for an HTTP server that listens on the correct port, there is no other restriction. You can use any programming language use any binary dependency. If it runs on a container, it runs on Cloud Run. And, and that's super powerful be, because containers can run anywhere. Because once you have your web application packaged into a container image, on Google Cloud, you can run containers on Compute Engine in a virtual machine, or on a Kubernetes cluster, or on Cloud Run. And on your local machine, you can use a container runtime, such as Docker or Podman. Martijn. Cool, good to see you. Um, so before we move on, here are the four things you need to remember from this short review of container technology. A container image is an archive with files. It includes executables, system libraries, data files, and more. A container is a running container image. It represents the running processes of your container. And then a container image packages everything your application needs to run. And if it is a Node.js application, for example, your JavaScript files are in that image next to the Node.js runtime. And Cloud Run expects your application to start on uh, an, an HTTP server. 
and your traffic is always encrypted on the Google network, and the public endpoint you get is HTTPS. So you don't have to manage that yourself. No web proxy required. Now let's explore how to get your application to Cloud Run. Um, when you deploy a container image for the first time, uh, Cloud Run creates a service. And now service is a very broad and non-specific word, but it means something very specific in Cloud Run. And the specifics will become clear during the session and the demo. But the first thing to know is that one service has only one active container image. The second thing to know is that every service has a public unique HTTPS endpoint, which is managed by Cloud Run. Cloud Run receives incoming requests to that public HTTPS endpoint. And to handle the requests, Cloud Run starts your container image uh, container on demand from your container image. And Cloud Run also makes sure to handle all incoming requests by starting more than one container if that's necessary. That's called auto scaling, and I will come back to that later. So in case you're already familiar with Google Cloud, you're probably wondering if you can also route incoming requests from the global load balancer to a Cloud Run service. The answer is yes. And if you want to know more, uh, I answer that in the course as well. And I will probably do a blog post about it soon. I want to pause here and direct, direct your attention again to that word service, because this is a key concept in Cloud Run. You create a service to deploy a container image. And then every service has a unique name and associated HTTPS endpoint. And you will interact primarily with the service resource to perform your tasks, such as deploying a new container image, um, rolling back to a previously deployed version, changing configuration settings like environment variables, and scaling boundaries. That's that's important, right? I think you probably read the blog post about the guy that racked up $70,000 in uh, charges because he created a Cloud Run service that called the Cloud Run service, and that called the Cloud, well, you got the picture. So let's take a step back and take a look at how your container image gets to Cloud Run. Because you're not sending it directly to Cloud Run, you use Artifact Registry as an intermediary storage. Cloud Run can only pull container images from Artifact Registry. And if you're used to hosting your container images somewhere else, um, keep in mind that with Cloud Run, you will need to push them to Artifact Registry first. Um, hold on. What's Artifact Registry? It's a um, fully managed service in Google Cloud. And you might know this as Google Container Registry. So Artifact Registry supersedes Google Container Registry, or GCR. Um, and it's a, it's a universal package manager. So you can use it to privately host your container images, Node.js packages, or Java packages. And I think apt packages, apt, uh, an apt repository is also supported now. And to host your container images, you create a Docker repository that Cloud Run can pull container from. So let's let's take a look at how that works. Um, as soon as you're ready to deploy your image to Cloud Run, you begin by pushing, well, that's a container language for uploading. You begin by pushing the image to the Docker repository on Artifact Registry. And your container image will get a unique image URL. And that's what you will use to deploy to Cloud Run. So once your container image has been pushed into the Docker repository, um, you, you, you can deploy it by handing the container reference over to Cloud Run. And Cloud Run will then pull the image from Artifact Registry. So as a developer, you open your CLI or web console. You enter a command to deploy your image with a reference to the container image URL. And there it goes. And then finally, Cloud Run pulls the container image from, from the Docker repository. And to ensure that containers on Cloud Run start reliably and fast, Cloud Run then copies and stores the container image locally. And this internal storage is super fast. It ensures that your image size is not a bottleneck for container startup time. This means that your four gigabyte large Python-based container image starts about just as fast loads loads as about just as fast as that nine megabyte large go statically compiled go binary um, and it also means because it copies the image uh, you won't get into trouble if you accidentally delete um, the original image in artifact registry or overwrite the, the, the tag it will just continue continue to work as when you deploy it cloud run pulls it uh, and copies it and you can't change it anymore so 
maybe it's good to pause here because um, with this whole story about container technology, I, I might have lost a few people. So because I, I've explained a lot of steps, right? How to get your container image to Cloud Run through Artifact Registry. And I didn't even talk about how to turn your source code into a container image yet, because to be honest, that's that's another talk. Now, and some people really like that, right? For some use cases, using a container-based workflow is great because it gives you a great amount of transparency and flexibility. If you build the container image, you have the, the, the power to decide exactly what file ends up where in your container image and how it gets there. However, in some cases, that power is just too much to handle. Sometimes you're just looking for a way what, to turn source code into an HTTPS endpoint. You want a source-based workflow. And you will want and you want your vendor, your vendor, to make sure that your container image is secure, well configured, and built in a consistent way that it doesn't run as root and that there are no security vulnerabilities hiding inside the Docker file that you grabbed from a random Stack Overflow answer, right? With Cloud Run, you can do both. You can use a container-based workflow as well as a source-based workflow. And at the very end of the demo, I will show you uh, uh, both. Now, let's talk about auto-scaling on-demand containers. What, uh, what does that mean? Cloud Run starts your container to handle incoming requests. Multiple requests can be handled by a container at the same time uh, concurrently. And as long as a container is handling requests, Cloud Run will not shut it down uh, unless something bad happens, like an application crash. By the way, that um, handling multiple requests at the same time is a crucial difference between Cloud Run and Cloud Functions uh, or AWS Lambda, because with a function, um, there's also a container running, but they build it for you. Uh, and only one HTTP request is handled by a container exclusively at the same time. But Cloud Run is just like a regular application. If you have a container running, it can do 80, 80 or 200 HTTP requests at the same time. Cloud Run automatically increases capacity when necessary to, to make sure it handles all incoming requests. And, and that's that feature that's called known as auto-scaling. And this is how it works. Every service has an internal load balancer. And that uh, HTTP load balancer distributes requests over the group of available containers. And then when Cloud Run notices that all containers are busy, uh, their CPU, CPU uses, usage is high, then Cloud Run starts to add additional containers to the service. And as soon as demand decreases again, Cloud Run stops sending traffic to some containers and, and, and keeps them idle for a while and then shuts them down. Now, the number of max, the maximum number of container instances in a Cloud Run service is limited to 1,000 by default. And if you need more, you can submit a request to Google support and ask for a quota increase. They will add more servers to their data center. I don't know. They will, they will need to plan for that. For that. So um, over 1,000 containers can unleash a lot of load on downstream systems and APIs. And I don't know, your relational database might not be able to handle that. So in practice, you'll find yourself lowering this limit more often than increasing it to safeguard the stability of your system. And when no requests come to the service for a while, uh, Cloud Run shuts down all containers. And a fresh container will start on demand as soon as new requests come in. You, you might know this as scale to zero, and this process is attractive for economic reasons, as this means you're not paying for idling containers. But that's not the whole story, right? Because the pricing model on Cloud Run is unique. You only pay for the system resources you use while a container is handling a request with a granularity of 100 milliseconds. So, and this this is this is interesting, right? Because most of other compute products, you know, uh, 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 virtual machines, uh, Kubernetes clusters, you are charged for servers as long as they are running, even if you're not using them. So that means you're often pay paying for idle server capacity. Another thing to realize is that you're charged for container time and not request time. So if your container can handle 50 requests at the same time, you're not paying 50x, but just one time for the container time. 
And the price of containers increase with CPU and memory. So you can use, um, you can allocate up to eight gigabytes of memory uh, and up to four CPUs, but those containers are more expensive. Now that you know how the pricing model of Cloud Run works, it won't be a surprise that the lifetime of a container on Cloud Run is only guaranteed while the container is handling requests. If it's not handling any requests, Cloud Run can decide to shut it down. That doesn't mean that it will, but it might. And, and in fact, containers live much longer than you would expect if they're not handling requests. And that's, and that's because um, as soon as a container is handling zero requests, its CPU is throttled to nearly zero. And this means that your application will run at a really slow pace. Well, th that's also why I put the throttle turtle. I hope you like him. Um, you can't do any meaningful work while your uh, container is throttled. And because, and this is important, if you've like zoned out a bit, pay attention to this slide, because this is a crucial difference between a traditional server and Cloud Run. Because Cloud Run shuts down and throttles idle containers, you should complete all work before you return the HTTP request. Because that request might be the very last one that's being handled by the container. And then, boom, uh, it's throttled. And maybe it's shut down. So either your work will be completed very slowly, uh, or it might not, not complete at all. So. And this is what confuses people because I put background tasks there, and and you might think uh, that you are not allowed to use background threads, um, and that's not true. I mean, if you use uh, non-blocking I/O and you do all work in in a, in a background thread, that's that's fine. Just make sure that everything is finished before you return a request to the user, because that request might be the last one to run there. So the solution is to uh, turn your background tasks into HTTP requests. That might feel a bit weird, but it actually makes sense in a way. Um, so there are two products on Google Cloud that help with this, uh, Cloud Tasks and, and Cloud Scheduler, and they're both well integrated with Cloud Run. And I'll try to explain Cloud Tasks in one sentence so you try, can figure out how this would work. Um, Cloud Tasks is, uh, is another service on Google Cloud, and you can call it and say, hey, a Cloud Task, can you call this HTTP request for me, retry it when it fails, and wait until it's done? Then, and in that way, you can create asynchronous tasks because this is relevant, right? You want to, I don't know, you receive a file upload from your user and you want to return the HTTP response immediately um, and not have him wait while you process the file. Well, you can use Cloud Task for that. And then you spin up a separate Cloud Run service to do the background uh, work. Uh, looking at, taking a short look at the questions. So yeah, Cloud Run, I meant uh, Cloud Tasks. I mentioned that. Um, the term, what's the turtle's name? I I didn't give him a name. I, I I take suggestions. Can I keep open database connections while throttled? Yeah, sure you can. It's just your CPU will be very slow. It, they don't kill it completely, right? So um, yeah, can can I can I keep open database connections open while it's throttled? Um, Yes, a TCP connection generally st uh, stays open if you don't close it, so uh, that works. And they are not—they're not removing all CPU, right? So you'll have a tiny sliver of CPU to—you you will get a slice of CPU time every now and then to make sure that you're because not all stacks are are very happy when they uh, don't get any CPU time and they suddenly time travel to a minute later. That's not uh, likely. Ooh, a Cloud Run versus App Engine question. I, uh, I'm getting back to that later. Um, there's another consequence to this concept of disposable containers. Uh, disposable because you don't have any control on when they start and when they stop. Um, and that has to do with how you store data, right? On a traditional server, you can store data directly on the server, on a disk. And on Cloud Run, uh, you can do that but you might lose it because the file system is in memory and it disappears with the container when the container is shut down. And that means, well, that means you will need to store persistent data in a downstream system. And um, you've been probably doing this already, right? So you will store binary data in cloud storage, uh, session data goes to a shared Redis instance. Uh, this is a memory store on Google Cloud. Uh, and your application data can go to a relational database. That's 
you don't need to use a, a serverless key, key, key value store. It's, you can just use a relational database. But the key thing to remember is that while you can write data to disk, and there are certainly valid use cases to do that, you should be prepared to lose the data. And everything that you want to, hold, want to keep a hold of, you save that downstream. Constantine asks um, about uh, uh, lifecycle hooks. So you can, uh, he's wondering if, uh, if, if, if your container stops, if you get a lifecycle hook to hook into it. And the answer is yes. And I actually wrote a blog post about this on the Google Cloud blog. It, it published last, yesterday. Now I'm sure Constantine can put the link in the, in the chat now. So, uh, but the answer is there. Portability is a valid concern for most application developers. And here are a couple reasons why. Because maybe your application needs to run in a geographical region where Google Cloud has no physical presence. And maybe you are required to also run it there because of data sovereignty issues, um, which is re uh, relevant, relevant for regulated in industries. Or maybe you're just, you, want, you, you're, you want to avoid vendor tie-in and you're afraid of high switching costs. Well, on Cloud Run, applications are portable in two ways. Uh, first, you use containers, and you already learned that containers can run anywhere. So that makes your application inherently portable, uh, expect, except you have to watch your dependencies, right? If you're using a Firestore, which is a proprietary database with no open source alternative, you might incur some switching costs if you're trying to migrate your app. The second reason why Cloud Run is portable is that because the platform Cloud Run is API compatible with Knative. And Knative is an open source product you can install on top of Kubernetes. So um, this is Knative is an entirely different implementation of the same API. And it mean, this means that you can take your Cloud Run application to Kubernetes, maybe even running on your own infrastructure. And you get the same runtime behavior and the same API to deploy your application and manage it life, its lifecycle, but on your own infrastructure. So um, yeah, that's portability. So to summarize, um, you learned about container images and how they are a package of your application and everything it needs, and that your application on Cloud Run can be written in any language using any library and any binary. Cloud Run just takes your container image and turns it into an HTTPS endpoint. It expects your application to listen on port 8080 and respond to HTTP requests. Um, to deploy your container image, you create a service resource. And this is the resource, and you will show that in a demo I'm, I'm starting soon. You will interact with this service resource to perform your tasks, such as deploying a new image, uh, rolling back to a previously deployed version, and changing configuration settings like environment variables and scaling boundaries. The pricing model of Cloud Run is unique. Uh, you are charged for container time while handling requests. But a consequence of this model is you can't rely on work to finish after you return the HTTP request. So we, you will need, need to take a, a different approach for that. Before I dive into the demo, I want to introduce you to the options you have available to interact with your Google Cloud uh, resources or your Cloud Run resources. There is the web console, and there's the G Cloud Terminal command line interface, which I'll, I will use in the demo. Uh, this web interface is a great way to get started. So most products feature polished getting started wizards that guide you through creating your first resources. And I, I certainly encourage you to, to take a look at Cloud Run and deploy the sample container and click around for a bit, because it's the experience is very smooth. It's almost like if you worked with other clouds. At Google Cloud, it's it's almost like they pay attention to creating a good UI for managing your cloud resources, which is great. Um, but the command line interface offers a good experience for those who like the command line, like I do. So you can write scripts. You get help, helpful suggestions. If you mistype a command, it's, it's generally, generally a good experience. So with that, um, it's off to the demo. And I have a little demo app I will show you. It's a, a, a Go application. And um, so I have a main.go file, uh, an HTML template, and uh, a Docker file that has a bunch of instructions to turn my source code into a container image. And uh, I can run it locally, go main.go. Oh. There it goes. Yes. 
I refresh my thing, and then here is my little application. And this um, collects a bit of metadata from my environment. Um, so the, the total memory of my, my laptop is uh, 32 gigs. Uh, it's running for one day and 22 hours. Uh, there's a big, oh, that sounds scary, that button. Uh, environment variables, uh, request headers. So this is what well, use, useful to get a feel of where your thing is running. And if I if I click this button, I'm calling a REST endpoint on this on the same thing that stops the process. That's why you see an exit code one here. And then it, after a second, it refreshes the page. And in this case, it's gone, right? So um, on Cloud Run, this is different. I will do the same thing and show you what uh, what changed. I see a lot of interesting questions questions popping up. I I will I will continue continue with the demo and then go through the questions in the end. Okay. So um, yeah. So try to remember what I told about how to get the application to Cloud Run. I needed to uh, put it in Artifact Registry first. So I will I will do that. I have to create a Docker repository, which is a private repository that can host my container image, vCloud artifacts. Oops. Oh, it looks like you made it an error. Maybe you want to do this. I like this. I like, I like this from Google from GCloud. GCloud artifacts. And then something with repositories. I want to oh, I can set IM policies. That's good news. Um, I want to create one. And what should I add here? Uh, a name. Okay, let's make that uh, Cloud Run demo. And then um, it needs a repository format, right? Because you can use, you can create. It's a universal package manager, so you can create a node, an npm repository, a Maven repository, or apps repository. Uh, so I will just add. Re repository, repository, format, uh, Docker. Yes. Um, oh, still not good. Cannot find attribute location. Yeah, yeah, I need to pick a cloud region. So I will do uh, US. That's a multi-region, actually. So it's now creating my repository. It's there. Good. Now um, I'm going to build my image locally and then push it to artifact registry. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't like build your images in, in Cloud Build or in, in your own CI. Um, I just like to demo it in this way because it also allows me to show how I make a change and that is pretty as a pretty smooth experience. Well, um, I'm first setting a few environment variables. So um, my project name using a subshell G Cloud config cat value project. So this is a, if you're not a, a bash hero, this is a subshell and and this command uh, it takes the output of this command and puts it in an environment variable. So if I do echo project now, project, it tells me the name of the project and that's kind of useful because uh, a, a project on Google Cloud is how you organize all resources. So I will need it in the image URL and this is the image URL. Uh, I will do us. Docker, because that's the location of the uh, artifact re repository, package.dev slash the project slash the name of the thing from Cloud Run Hello, then uh, the name of the image, right? So this, this is the image URL. And I will need to, when I build my container image locally, I will need to tag it with this thing. Um, OK, what's next? Uh, build, build the thing, Docker build um, tag. Well, that's the image URL. Uh, all the files are in this directory, and I wanted to use the Docker file I have there. I know this is optional. I'm just adding it to make it more obvious. It's there. Well. Um, now I need to push it from my local machine to Artifact Registry. And that means that Docker needs to know how to authenticate to Google Cloud. Um, and G Cloud has a helper script to help me configure that. So G Cloud auth configure Docker, oops, Docker, and then 
for the US Docker .dev domain. And then it's already done because you only have to do this one time, but I'm showing it because you might not have and get stuck at this point. And so do this one time only, and then you can Docker push your image URL. And then fingers crossed it will work. There it goes. Uh-oh, Club Run, hello, repository not found. I sure made a tempo, typo there. I used the wrong image tag. Right, that's the image. Next time you see me making an error, please let me know. It happens always. So I will need to rebuild the thing with the new tag. It'll be quick. Because it's all in cache, and then I need to push it again. There it goes. OK, my container image is in Google Cloud. Now I just want to deploy it. Gcloud run. That's Cloud run. So Gcloud run, oh, deploy. That sounds good. Gcloud run deploy. Um, image, uh, that's the image. And then I need to give it a name. I'll do a hello world. world. Uh, and I want to allow uh, public access, allow them authenticated. Um, Authenticated. There we go. It's not deploying my image. Yeah, I see a question about whether to use Cloud Run or Cloud Functions for a simple Node application. What are the criteria? Um, well, it depends. If like the the heuristic I use is that Cloud Functions are very great to like. Uh, to use as glue to turn existing APIs to, to, together. Like maybe you have an upload that lands in a cloud storage bucket and you want to do something with it and move it on or, or as a part of a workflow. But if it more if it's more like an app uh, and you use like it's you start it and you you handle multiple uh, HTTP requests at the same time, that's more cloud run. And the difference is if you want to uh, manage the uh, the process of turning your source code into a container uh, yourself. That, that's that's mainly the, the criteria, but like the line between Cloud Run and all the other uh, things are blurring uh, because well, Cloud Run now also has source-based deploys, which I will show you. Um, so that's the the question of Constantin. Um, there it is. My 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 app is running in in, in Google Cloud uh, on Cloud Run, and it tells me more now than it did locally, right? So the time is one minute already. Uh, this is the that's funny. Somebody probably sent a request to it. Um, and it has uh, uh, one VB CPU. It's running in the region, uh, US Central 1. There's a service account and an instance ID, right? So probably uh, if I stop the thing now and it refreshes, uh, I get a new instance with a new ID, right? So that's auto healing in action. If, if your container stops, then Cloud Run usually makes sure to, st to start a new one if a, if a new request comes in. And now you can see that the uptime is zero seconds, right? Because, and it makes sense because this was the first request that landed there. And then when I refresh, the uptime is 18 seconds, right? So now I, the container has been running for 18 seconds and I've sent two requests to it. So that means I paid for 200 milliseconds of container time, and my app has been running for 18 seconds, or maybe 35. So three requests, 300 milliseconds of billable time, uh, including the startup, and then uh, five, 35 seconds of uptime. And so a container is not immediately stopped. Uh, when I refresh again, 51 seconds. So. A container is not immediately stopped when there's no request coming in, uh, and that's because they they idle it, right? So the CPU is throttled, and uh, that probably means less cost for them. Um, and you can even tell. Uh, I I only want I, I I I always want one idle container running to avoid cold starts. So that's when no containers are ready, and you have to start a container on demand to handle that first request. That might take a while because your app needs, um, I don't know, 10 seconds to start or maybe longer. Uh, so you can 
tell Cloud Run to always keep an idle container running and at a fraction of the cost because it's throttled. Um, yeah, so let's let's show the edit uh, deploy workflow. I will, I will change the title to uh, hello GNL and women tag makers. Save it, uh, and then the next steps are uh, build, oops, build image. Again, and then push it. And then push it. And then it's there. Um, and now I can do another deploy cycle. Deploy. And if I refresh, it will say, hello, GGGNL and women tech makers. So that's that's quite an easy um, deploy work um, workflow, right? Um, and then I also promised to um, show the source-based workflow, right? So the, what I will do now is remove the Docker file. Remove, it's gone, I'll show you. It's gone. And then uh, I will do uh, gcloud beta run deploy hello world. And then provide the current directory as the source directory. And no dashes there. Hello world. And what happens now is that it takes my source directory and uploads it to Google Cloud, and then it will figure a look at the source code and figure out what to do to to to, to compile and deploy it. Right. So, um, and in this case, it will see a go.mod file, and then it will think, okay, I will need to uh, install the Go dependencies and compile the thing, and then I have a binary, put it into a container image, and and that's the thing. But if it's a package.json file it sees, then it will run an npm install. And, and the nice thing about this is that the technology that's behind this uh, is a Google Cloud build pack, pack, build pack, and they open sourced this. And this has been, it doesn't have to do anything with the Cloud Build file, uh, Cloud Build YAML file, Constantine. Um, I, I should remove that probably because it's confusing. Um, so, and this is the same, they, they like App Engine, you had this um, uh, approach already, right? So you, in, with App Engine, you do, you do, you just write your source and then do G Cloud app deploy, um, and it will compile your source and uh, figure out how to turn that into a container image. Uh, they they took the code that did that and open sourced it, and that's a that's a Google Cloud build pack, and and it's now in Cloud Run as well. And you can use the same thing to to uh, do to build functions. And if you want to reproduce the build process on your local machine, you can install this uh, pack command line utility, uh, and then uh, then it's uh, and then you can use that. Well, let's refresh, and then oh, I should have changed the title. Um, well, I can show the revision number that changed, right? So this is the third time I deployed, and, and even though that I re removed the Docker file, the third revision is there now. So uh, this is uh, how it works. And with that, my uh, demo is gone, and uh, I can uh, go to the questions. So let me see. Can Cloud Run be used for ETL jobs in GCP? Um, yeah, I suppose. You get an HTTPS endpoint where you send I can send a request to, and then you can do something with it. And you have, well, you can have up to four G, uh, CPUs uh, and eight gigs of memory, so you can do some something useful with it. Um, but probably data flow, data flow is a better approach for that. Uh, how about DDoS attacks? Yeah, so um, 
depends on the kind of DDoS attack. So if it, uh, a lot of the DDoS approaches don't get uh, to the level, uh, well, well, it will be filtered by Google's infrastructure, but if you're afraid of this, you can decide to put your um, application behind the global load balancer, and then you can enable Cloud Armor. And it's either already supported or it isn't, and they're still working on it. But that will come soon. So you will come if you're like if you want to uh, use cloud, cloud armor to guard and uh, against DDoS attacks, um, route traffic through the global load balancer only, uh, and, and enable cloud armor. And it's either in preview or will be coming soon. Well, that's DDoS. When would you use Cloud Runner One functions? Uh, I think I've already talked about that, uh, and it depends a bit. Yeah, Cloud Run is a su successor of App Engine Flexible. Um, are there reasons to use App Engine over Cloud Run? Uh, there are still differences. I'm expecting those differences to become smaller and smaller. Um, App Engine Flexible is a, is a different thing, uh, right? Because Flexible App Engine Flexible runs on top of Compute Engine. It's virtual machines, and App Engine manages them for you. Um, yeah. So, uh, but while App Engine, Cloud Run, Cloud Functions run directly on top of Borg, they're they're globally distributed container uh, thing, which apparently provides great scalability. So uh, you don't need to be afraid that App Engine will be discontinued uh, soon, anytime soon, or because it's a generally available product and uh, they will continue supporting it for a long time. At least that's what I've been told and I believe them. Um, what are typical use cases for Cloud Run? Well, running an application um, is, is one. Um, anything that handles HTTP requests. So that's almost any web application. What are main considerations when choosing between managed? So you want to know if I if you should take GKE or Cloud Run. Um, yeah, so uh, let's look at the things that GKE has and Cloud Run hasn't. Uh, GKE has uh, sidecars, if you like that. Uh, GKE has um, uh, cron jobs, and you can use the entire ecosystem of all of all Kubernetes to extend your application. So that's not in Cloud Run. Um, but then, what Cloud Run offers is a very convenient way to define your application and deploy it. Uh, and you can, if you like best of both worlds, you can use uh, Knative on top of Kubernetes. And there's also a managed Knative version on top of Google Kubernetes Engine. Uh, I think that's that's called uh, Cloud Run for Antes. Uh, right now, should I use Cloud Run or Cloud Functions for a simple Node app? Um, yeah, if, if it's application, go for Cloud Run or App Engine. If it's more like something to tie existing APIs together, uh, go for Cloud Functions. And if you like the source based, like here's a, a text field, drop my um, uh, source code in there, go for Cloud Functions. And then it's also updated whenever you deploy, so they will manage the minor upgrades for you. Version stacks, routing, yes, uh, I love to tell more about that, but that's a different talk. Um, I don't have anything else. Great. It was a really nice talk. Thank you so much, Pizza, for answering all the questions and everything. That was great. Cool. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Pizza, for uh, hosting this talk today. Very informative. Glad you liked it. And uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think uh, we're done for today. Uh, you can, again, like started at the beginning, you can find DDGNL and Women Tech Makers uh, on Meetup for our other Meetups. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Bye. Definitely. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, thank you, you again.